Um, these are the sessions that we have for the next two days. Uh, I'm not going to read them out loud, but the whole point here is that we can dive deeper into a particular topic by essentially you know, putting speakers together who will be experts in that field. And then we have an opportunity to have a little discussion about it. Some of the sessions will have individual Q and A's where the speakers will immediately after their talk remain on stage and we can ask questions. Uh, some of them will have a little Q and A panel discussion type of thing that we'll do here at the uh, stock room control, or whatever you call it, stock exchange control board, which by the way is fascinating. Um, on the break, you should totally come and uh, sneak on the stage and look at whatever that machinery is over there. It looks highly advanced. Um, I don't know how important the, the Helsinki stock market has ever been to international uh, you know, finance, but uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that some buttons there have pressed and uh, made, made fortunes. And yeah, the most important track, of course, is the hallway track. You know, this is where you come in. So on the breaks, you know, we have coffee breaks, we have lunches. Um, you know, there's uh, basically this whole building or this whole area, every open door is, is in, our, in our use. So please do, uh, do this thing, what do we call it? Networking? Ugh, I don't like networking. Uh, let's make friends. How about that? So, uh, you know, please do, uh, you know, have chats. And again, like, uh, like I said, you know, if you do see a Finnish pe person awkwardly standing in a corner uh, looking at their uh, tips of their shoes, please do go say hello. I'm sure that they will uh, appreciate it. Uh, and also in our breaks, uh, please do talk to our sponsors. Um, you know, these local companies are, you know, basically big supporters of not only, you know, Future Frontend, but also React Finland. And uh, you know they make these events possible. They keep the tickets affordable. So thank you so much for our sponsors, uh, Gofor or Gofore, as we would say in Finnish, uh, Elisa, Noet, and Alma. Yeah, and we the, this year we have not only one but two after parties. Uh, one tonight at Gofor office. There is still space, so please go and sign up. Uh, there's a link in the schedule uh, on futurefrontend.com, and there's gonna be food, uh, drinks, and great party. And tomorrow, after party will be held at Rooftop Miami. It's quite close by. It's on the top of uh, Stockman. Uh, a department store? Yes, thank you. <laughs> and uh, there will also be food and drinks and good music and laughter. So please uh, sign up there as well. Yes, and I'm not going to make any promises, but tradition has been that the after after party happens at uh, Jaskan Grilli, which is this. Uh, night snack place near the uh, near the parliament building so you know like if you uh, if you're still there when the party ends tomorrow we can all go and eat some greasy meat pies um, um, but yes whether you have a meat pie in hand or drink in hand or you're just here at the conference or any of our digital venues uh, we do have a code of conduct uh, so we want to, want to make sure that this event is is safe and and uh, welcoming to everyone um, I think you all pretty much, you look like nice people. Uh, I think you know how to behave. But if you don't know how to behave, please do Google uh, Berlin Code of Conduct. Um, this is not the Code of Conduct that you use when you go to Berlin. This is, um, this is the official sort of like Code of Conduct format that you can find out by Googling that. And if you have any issues, uh, please do report them at the help desk at the front. You can also speak to anyone with the orange badge, which I forgot to wear, but uh, you know, Tuli here has. And speaking of lanyards and badges, Yes, if you see someone with a red lanyard, I don't see any at the moment, but that means that they don't want to be photographed or videoed, so please do not uh, at least uh, publish any photos or videos of them without their permission. But once you have scanned your photos uh, for le red lanyards, uh, we do want you to share them. I don't really know why we want this. I think there is some sort of um, digital marketing economy thing happening. But if you're on the social medias, uh, you know, Twitter, Blue Sky, Mastodon, uh, Parler, whatever, uh, please do uh, use the hashtag future frontend so other attendees can also find your, your pictures and your content. Um, and then speaking of participating in the event, um, we do have something new this year. So when we're gonna do this Q&A uh, at, at the bottom of every block, um, you have two ways of asking questions. You can either raise your hand and somebody will run you a microphone, or during at any point during the block of talks, you can submit questions uh, through your mobile telephone and or laptop um, by going to an address called sly.do and using this code FF2023. Um, you know, we will remind you of this at the, uh, at the actual Q&A time, but please do uh, you know, commit this uh, very long URL into memory. I think this will be very helpful if you want to ask questions, but you don't want to be bothered with, uh, with actually speaking to a microphone and having to do the whole, oh, that was a really good talk, thank you. Now here's my question, this is actually a comment. Um, so you can, you know, you can, you can do that by uh, going to Slido. 
Yeah, and do not forget to join the conference Slack. Uh, you can find the link from futurefrontend.com. And there will be, you'll find your friends and, and, and party company from there, as well as the actual conference info. All right. So I think we're about ready to start our first session. Uh, let's all say thank you to Tuli, who we'll see, see later. Uh, thank you, Tuli. <laughs> Um, yes, Mishko, please come in and, uh, and set up your laptop. I will fill the time while you, while you do so. Now, so this is, uh, you know, first feature front end. And like Tuli said, you know, like in the past, this event has been called React Finland. And I myself have been a React developer for, for many years, and I'm pretty sure many of you have been as well. But uh, in this first block, we're going to sort of like ask and hopefully answer the question, what is coming next? What are some of the future approaches that we might take to actually building web applications? So we have two great speakers. Uh, we have Mishko Heveri, who I'll introduce in a minute, and then we will have Ryan Carniato from, from Solid. Um, and then after that, we're going to do a little Q&A conversation. So please do ask any questions that these, uh, you know, this topic raises in your mind on, on Slido by going to slido.do and using the code FF2023. Um, but yeah, without Further ado, uh, so Mishko is the CTO at Builder.io. He's been uh, a powerhouse of, of open source and JavaScript for the longest time. You know, at Google, you know, he, he worked on a created Angular, AngularJS, I believe, and also co-creator of Karma and all other great libraries that we have known to come, love, and depend on. And now he's working on something really new and exciting. And let's all give a warm welcome to Mishko. Hello. Uh, yesterday we had a speaker dinner, and I was told that Finnish people have no sense of humor. And I'm going to try this out, see how much you're going to laugh. How do you measure functions? So you have to prove, me, prove them wrong by laughing, right? You measure functions in parameters. No? No? Come on. It's not that bad. <laughs> I will continue until I get some good laughs out of the audience. All right. Let's talk about reactivity. Uh, and specifically, I'm going to you know, have this fancy title of comparing how reactivity works across frameworks. And I think it's enlightening. And uh, so yeah, let, let's kind of dig in more into it. So first of all, hi, I'm Mishko. That's me. Uh, I'm CTO at Builder. Um, I did this thing called, yes, called AngularJS, Angular. And now I just can't help myself. I'm doing framework number three quick. I promise this is the last one. Um, yeah, I'm going to retire after this one. This is going to be it. So a little bit about Builder. Uh, we build headless visual CMS. Those are fancy words that I don't know how to explain other than, you know Wix? Well, it's like Wix, but the big difference is Wix is hosted on their servers. This can be on your server. So this is something you own. And so you can make your own component, and they can drag and drop. So the marketing can update the website without bothering you as an engineer. And they have full control of the layout. Anyways, at Builder, we do open source. And um, there is the open source team, Adam Bradley. He's from Ionic. If you've used Ionic, you know, he's the creator of that. Uh, Manuel uh, Martinez is uh, also from Ionic. Uh, but he worked on this thing called Jin. Jin is a kind of like express for Go. And Sami is working on Mitosis. Mitosis allows you to write a single piece of uh, front end code and have it available in every single framework, so by transpiling it over. And PartyTown allows you to run code once and uh, sorry, run uh, third-party code in a web worker. So it brings kind of like multi-threading into applications. OK. So the thing I really, really care about is um, making the web fast. And the way you make the web fast is really you have to send in less JavaScript. Uh, right? it's, kind of, uh, uh, it's kind of amusing. Like it's so obvious, and yet it's so hard to get. Um, and so in order to get less JavaScript, you have to make sure that um, you execute as little code as possible, right? Because if, you're, if your strategy for updating the UI is to re-execute every single piece of code on the, in the application, which is kind of the strategy of many frameworks, then that means that all of the code has to be on the client. And if the, all the code is on a client, then you, know, you, you can't really figure out a way to lazy load it, right? Or as I like to put it, yeah, all frameworks support lazy loading but only for components that are not currently in the render tree. If the component is in the render tree, then lazy loading kind of doesn't work. So I care about this particular bit. And so resumability kind of requires fine-grain reactivity. And 
really what we're going to do here is we're going to kind of dive into the fine-grained reactivity and the trade-offs between frameworks and how do different frameworks work. And I think it's enlightening. And so uh, hopefully you can take me on, on this journey. Uh, so what do I mean by fine-grained reactivity? Uh, let's kind of define it from here. Uh, what I mean is that if a value changes, right, there is some way that the state of the system changes. Let's say you have a counter, right? Let's do the simplest possible application of a counter. If you have a counter and you increment the count, right, um, how much of the application code does the, the framework need to execute to figure out what DOM element needs to be uploaded, right? So if you look at frameworks like Angular and React, the answer is pretty much the whole application. Right? It starts at the root and then re-executes everything. And the fact that you have to re-execute the whole application is a problem both in terms of uh, performance but also in terms of the fact that, hey, all of this code has to be present on the client for you to be able to interact with, with anything. So let's look at different uh, frameworks and see how they work. So disclaimer, this is my opinions, you know, different opinions, different people might have different opinions. Uh, so let's see, let's kind of dive into it and kind of figure this out. But first of all, I want to kind of tell you that there are, as far as I can tell, there are three fundamental ways to do reactivity. Um, there is what I call regular JavaScript values, you know, just this good old value. Um, there are signals and there are observables. And the way to think about it is that a value is just essentially value, you know, let x equals 42, x is the value, right? And there is a signal which is kind of like value except that it's in a bucket. So it's not, it's not that you are directly referring to the value 42. Instead, you are referring to a bucket, and inside of the bucket is 42. So usually when you have signals, you, you don't just refer to them as x. You either refer to them as x.value, or you do it uh, like in solid case, you do x is a function, so you call it with parentheses. Uh, but fundamentally, you know, you are doing something, some extra step in order to read or write the value. Uh, and this extra step is basically a way for the framework to observe that you are either doing a read or you're doing a write, right? There is no way to observe um, that you are reading or writing a variable x. So, so, the, so signals are basically a bucket. And the purpose of that bucket is so that the framework can observe when a read or write happens. An observable is, the really the good way to think about observables is that there are values over time. And the way to think about it is um, there is a setup phase where you kind of set up the plumbing. You know, you, you, you set up, you know, what is connected to what, you know, how does the data flow? So you, you run the setup phase where you call subscribes and things of that sort. And then there is the actual runtime phase where, you know, you throw values on one end of the pipe and some other thing happens on the other end of the pipe. And the thing to kind of understand about observables is they are values over time, right? The, the time component is really a fundamental property of observables. If you look at regular values or signals, you know, there is no time component, right? It's, it's just the thing that happens to be in there at the moment. Whereas observables really have a time component, right? If you set up an observable that is listening to click events and you ask the question, what is the current click event? That question that doesn't really make sense, right? Because you know a click event happens at a specific point in time, and to talk about a click event only makes sense at that point in time when it actually happened. To talk about a click event before or afterwards is kind of meaningless, right? So observables are kind of values over time, and so you know again I'm going to show you uh, kind of the differences, right? For for values it's really simple. It's just you know answer equals 42. Uh, and the way you read an observable is you just say console.log, sorry, the way you, my, my apologies, the way you read a value is you just say console.log, answer, comma, and you just say answer, right? You just refer to the variable and then you read it. The way you read a signal, um, the way you create a signal is that usually there's some kind of a factory that does the thing, you know, it, it, it could be signal, create signal, um, use signal, you know, different frameworks have this and since it's not important. And then there's a way for you to read the value. And it really is, comes into two forms. One is that you, 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 what you get back is a function that you call, like you can see over here, answer with parentheses, so it's a, it's a getter. Or it's like answer dot value or answer dot current or something like that, right? So there's some kind of a getter setter property uh, thing. 
So, so you read and write the signals slightly differently so the framework can observe it. And finally, there's observables. And I think the, the important thing to understand about observables is that the way you read it is you create a subscription. Right? You pass in a callback. And this is important because what it means is that you aren't guaranteed when exactly the callback runs. Right? When you have you know, a signal and you want to read a signal, you when you execute that piece of code, that's when you get the value. It's, it's synchronous, right? And your code is pulling the value out of the store by calling answer parentheses or answer that value. It is at that moment when you are pulling the value out, right? Whereas if you are doing a subscription, you don't know when that function is going to get called. It will get called at some point in the future. And this actually is a, is a problem. And so Svelte actually has so, uh, observables. And so the Svelte basically says uh, the observables must call the callback function synchronously at the time of registration so you can get the current value. And that's kind of the, the workaround for that. Um, so, so those are the kind of the three big categories. And um, when you talk about reactivity, you know, how exactly would you do reactivity in those three big categories? And so I'm going to make an assertion, which is that the only way to do reactivity with values is to do dirty checking. I know that dirty checking may be like a bad word or a different way of calling it, but like fundamentally, that is the only thing you can do, right? Like the framework uh, knows what the values are today at some point in time. And at some point, it, the framework somehow decides, OK, it's time to see if we need to update the UI. And what it does is it rereads all of these values and compares them to the previous value. And if the value changes, then the framework goes and renders the UI. Right? So, so Angular does this uh, by um, re-executing all of the uh, expressions right? and rereading the values. And if the value changes, Angular knows to go and update the UI. React does the same exact thing. Every time you change the state, the React re-executes all of the components. Those components rebuild the VDOM. And then the React dirty checks the previous VDOM with the current VDOM to determine if it needs to update anything. Right? So my argument here is that like, if you are in the world of values, really the only thing available to you is dirty checking. And you, know, you get to decide how and when to run it. Uh, et cetera, uh, but at the end of the day, you are really just comparing the previous value to the current value in order to determine, you know, was there a change? And if so, you know, what UI do I update? Now, frameworks that use signals have an advantage because um, instead of having to rerun and kind of re-dirty check all the code, uh, they know when a write has happened, so they know when the state has been mutated, and they also know when a read has happened. So they know when there is a potential for subscription. The read actually causes a subscription, and we'll kind of explain it in a second. And so um, I, I'm going to argue that frameworks that are, uh, use signals are more, react, more fine-grained reactive than the frameworks that use values. Because if you use a value, you have to essentially do dirty checking, which means you have to kind of rerun the whole world to see if anything has changed. Whereas if you use signals, then the signals are giving you lots of information about what exactly has changed. And then hopefully, the framework is efficient in kind of figuring out what actually has to be rerun. And we're going to talk about how different frameworks have different level of efficiency in this particular category. Um, so, so signals, just by their nature, are just more fine-grained than values. And observables are essentially like signals in that sense, except they have this um, subscription. And it is not necessarily clear whether the framework can observe writing into, uh, into the uh, uh, observable. It can certainly observe the output, because the output is the subscription. And so um, observables are kind of a different way of doing it. I, my personal opinion is that signals are much better fit for frameworks than observables because signals are more um, you know, pull right, rather than push. So kind of the review, you know, uh, value is, is essentially that. Um, the signal, the way it is implemented, right, is that you know, in this particular case, we have a signal that is a, a property, not a function. So previously, I showed you the function kind. This is the property kind. So the way you read this is you say count that value or count that value equals, you know, whatever, one, two, three. And so in both cases, 
that, that getter gets called and that setter gets called. And in this case, we just update the value so that nothing really interesting happens. But you can see how you can place interception logic inside of the getter or the setter. And so what you can do is you can create a global context, something like this. And then you can create a method like autosubscribe. And what the autosubscribe method does is it takes a, some piece of function. And uh, when the function runs, before it runs, it sets up a global context. And then the function executes, right? as you can see over here on, on the fn line. And then we can change the, the way the signal factory works. And what the signal factory does is that right before it does a get on a value, it looks for the global context and says, hey, uh, am I running inside of the special autosubscribe function? Right? And if I am, then it simply pushes um, itself to the list of subscribers. Right? So not only do you have a current value of the system, but you also have a list of subscribers that are in there. And so the way signals work is that if you perform a read of a value, you're implicitly telling the framework that I am interested in this value. So if this value changes, I need to be re-executed. Right? So the, the reading of the value is how you show interest. And so you can see that when you do a read, when you call the getter, um, it adds the, the, the particular value into a list of subscriptions. And then the reason you do, do all this work is that when, you call, when somebody calls a set, you can then notify everybody saying, like, hey, um, go and you know, do something because those values that you think you had have not changed, and so you might have to rerun some stuff. So this is how signals work. It's pretty kind of straightforward. Um, the way streams work is kind of similar, but you know, there is no uh, automatic subscription on get. Instead, you explicitly subscribe by calling the subscribe function. Uh, when you write into the stream, uh, you basically uh, just iterate over your subscriptions, right? So you explicitly add values to subscribe using uh, to subscriptions by calling a subscribe, and you um, uh, implicitly kind of call the for each on all the subscriptions when you do a write into it. Um, in this particular case, notice that I say there's a green comment saying synchronously notify. This is required for uh, UI systems, uh, but this is not normally how observables work. Um, and so this is why I think it's, it's a kind of a kludge to use observables with frameworks because that's, they don't really fit uh, very well into this model. Okay, so let me kind of summarize this for you. So you have values, right? And so in this case, we are passing by reference, right? So we have a value directly. You have a signal, which is really a container of value. And you have observables, which are a container of values. Notice the plural. Right? because it's values over time. And so when you want to talk about time components, right, values and signals really have no concept of time, whereas observables really do. It's values over time. And so the way you access a value is direct. You just do a read. The way you do signals is you call some kind of a getter, right, which kind of gives, which pulls the value out. So I'm going to say it is pull-based, meaning that the act of reading a value pulls the value out. Whereas observables are push-based, right? When you subscribe the callback, you are not really getting the value at the time. Instead, the callback gets called either synchronously uh, in some frameworks or sometimes in the future when the value changes, right? And so the way to think about it is that observables are really push. They're pushing the value into the stream when the time comes. And so there is no subscription. Um, inside of the values, right? Because you can't do it. And so that's why you have to do dirty checking. And the subscription in the case of signals is implicit. It's the act of reading the value that creates a subscription on this particular thing. And in the case of observable, it's an explicit. Somebody has to call the subscribe, right? And when somebody has to call the subscribe, that means somebody also has to call the ups unsubscribe. So observables do have. Uh, kind of a memory foot gun where you forget to call a, uh, unsubscribe and you uh, therefore forget to clean up memory. And so the asynchronous model um, is, you know, with values there's really none. With signals, um, it is synchronous. It's, you, you get notified. Everything that happens within signals is synchronous. You know, at the time when it happens, things get notified, et cetera. Whereas in observables, it could be synchronous or it could be asynchronous. You know, it's either things get called, the callback gets called immediately, or sometimes in the future, you don't know. So it's kind of a hybrid system. And the other interesting thing to talk about is the, the idea of a graph. What I mean by graph is that 
um, when you read the values, when you create the subscriptions, you create a graph of saying like, oh, if this value changes, I have to update this particular part. Um, the nice thing about signals is that the, the graph changes, meaning like right now when I change this value, I have to update this. But in the future, it might be that I don't no longer have to update this, but I may have to update something completely different. Um, observables are a lot more fixed. Uh, it is possible to do what I just described, but because of because observables have kind of two phases, a phase one where you set up the pipeline and phase two where the pipeline is running, they tend not to change over time. And so as a result, you, you really think of observables as a fixed thing. You know, you set up the pipeline at the beginning and once the pipeline is set up, um, it is what it is usually for the duration of the application. So I really like the fact that signals have a kind of a dynamic property. So um, as you can tell, I'm really, really partial to signals. Um, and so let's have a application. I'm going to show you a test application. And then we're going to go through it and see how different frameworks behave. And hopefully, it's going to give you an insight as to what's going to happen underneath it. So super simple application. It's going to be just a counter, and it's going to have a state, right? And you click a button to increment, and the counter increments. Except that it's a little too simple, and you won't be able to really see the differences between the frameworks. So let's, let's make it more complicated. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to break the counter up. I'm going to leave the state inside of the counter, but I'm going to put the mutation in a separate component called the incrementer, and I'm going to put the display showing of the value in a separate component called the renderer. And the reason I'm breaking it up is I want to show you what happens when you know, we, when we build application, we don't have a single component that does everything. We, instead, we have many components that collaborate together, right? And if you kind of break this down, you realize it all comes down to the fact that there is a state in one component, there is a mutation of that state in another component, and then there is a rendering of that state in a third component, right? So this is kind of the more realistic scenario of real-world application, except even that is not fully realistic. We have to do one more thing. We have to introduce a wrapper component. And a wrapper component doesn't actually do anything useful. It is sole purpose of it is to usually just kind of wrap an existing component and usually put like extra um, divs or whatever for the purposes of the UI layout. But in itself, it doesn't do anything useful. And so you can think of the wrapper component as being inert. It doesn't do anything. But what it does do is that it causes prop drilling, right? When you want to pass the value of the counter into the display component, you have to prop drill through the wrapper. And so the reason why I want to show you this particular setup is because this kind of shows the simplified view of all of the pieces. So what's going to happen is, Inside of the incrementer, you are going to mutate the value. Therefore, you're going to update the state. And then the state has to go through the wrapper into the display to be uh, rendered. And so the thing we're interested in is that in this situation, how much code has to execute? And so I think, this is my personal point of view, I think this is how it breaks out in terms of coarseness. You know, like, Angular React are on one extreme, they're, they're coarse. They have to kind of re-render, rerun the whole application at a time. And then as you move towards uh, the right-hand side, you get more and more fine-grained reactivity. So before I dive into this, let me show you demos of how this actually works. OK, so first up is React. Um, and notice. I've kind of made a, uh, you know, I have this counter on a top that contains a wrapper and an incrementer, and then inside of it I have a display. And so the way it works is if I'm going to hit the plus one button, the, the count will increment, right? But also I have instrumented it so you can see the re-render count, right? And currently the re-render count says one. That's because when the application first woke up on a client, you know, hydration executed, and hydration requires that all the components have to re-execute. And so the hydration basically caused the first execution of your application. So before you even start doing anything on your app, before you even interact with it, it has already executed all the components that are currently visible, right? And so when I go and click plus one, notice that every single component on a page has re-rendered. Right? Uh, basically, React just reran the whole thing end to end to figure out, you know, it computed the original VDOM during hydration. 
Now, when you click plus one, it rerun the whole thing, computed a new VDOM, and now it's dirty checking the two DOMs, right? It's comparing the previous and the current VDOM, and based on that, it figures out that between the previous state and the current state, the only thing that changed was the, the value zero to one, and so it updates the DOM element. So it's efficient in the DOM updates, but it does a full diff of previous DOM to the current DOM. Okay, so next up is view. So let's uh, look at the view, and let me zoom in a little more. And view actually come um, is, uh, okay, well, well, let's do this particular thing. So again, what you see is that uh, all of the counts say one, right? What it means is that at the beginning, hydration caused the system to re-render all the components, right? And so hydration, um, you know, we have already re-rendered the whole application, which means if you wanted to lazy load a particular component, you couldn't have, right? Or rather, the, the component would eagerly be forced to be loaded. So if I hit plus one here, notice how it's different from React. Um, notice that the, the count incremented, because that's where the state is kept. The wrapper incremented, because the state is prop drilled through the wrapper. The display incremented, because, well, it needs to increment the actual value. But the incrementer did not increment. Right? The incrementer did not update, meaning that the, the, the view uh, was intelligent in a sense that it was smart enough not to go there. Now, I know at this point you're going to say, like, yeah, hey, but in React, I can also prune trees, right? You can use memos, et cetera. And that's all true, but I'm interested here in what does the thing do out of the box, right? In all systems, there are ways of pruning the trees, but what does it do out of the box is what we kind of want to talk about. And so you see that view out of the box without really even doing anything as a developer. It, it already has a better behavior because it is intelligent enough not to do these particular things. But it turns out there's a second way of doing things in, uh, in view. And that is instead of prop drilling the values across, uh, what you can do is you can uh, create the reference, so view is kind of signal based, and you can pass the reference essentially through injection or like through a context into the display bypassing the wrapper. And so now if I hit plus one, notice that view only Im uh, impl uh, incremented the display. The render count on display is now two. All of the other ones have stayed one. So this is a more fine-grained uh, reactivity, except that I'm going to argue that this is not how you write applications by default. You can do this, and it certainly is better, but most of the time, um, you know, you're going to do this because that's kind of the more natural way and it's the thing that everybody, you know, tells you. Do this by default and then when you need to optimize it, you can do this thing over here, right? And so that's the kind of the two ways of doing it. Now, next up is Swelt. And let's make this a little bigger. Oops. Okay. So, again, Svelte, when it first comes up, it has to rerun all the components. That's why everybody gets one, right? That's the hydration doing its work. And if I hit plus one, um, notice Svelte didn't update any of the counts. And so you might think, like, oh, wow, the Svelte is amazing. You know, it, uh, it really knows how to do this thing right. Except that it's just really, really hard in Svelte to trick it to do this but there's still a compiler underneath it. And if you look at uh, what I've done is I instrumented the code running inside of the console log. And what, can, what you can see is that the counter, wrapper, and a display update it. And that kind of makes sense, right? Because the counter is where the value is stored. When the value changes, um, Svelte kind of does uh, you know, change detection. It's very efficient, but it still does that. And it goes and updates the wrapper internally. You can see its console log is uh, displaying, but it's refusing to kind of, you know, it, it, I don't know how to trick it to kind of show me that stuff. So I can only do it through console logs. And then it finally does the display. So really, what, should be, what you should be seeing is that they, the counter has incremented, the wrapper has incremented, the display has incremented, by the, but the incrementer did not. So really, the behavior here is the same as the view. And just like view, in Svelte, you can use stores. So Svelte has two kinds of reactivity. One kind of reactivity is when you're inside of a Svelte file, you can do one kind of syntax. But if you want to do reactivity across Svelte files, um, you need to do a different kind of reactivity they call stores. And it actually has different syntax. So if you use stores, then if I hit plus one, 
Notice it only rendered display and store display. That's because the store was declared inside of the, um, sorry, it only uh, updates the store display. It did not update anything else, right? So let me clear this. See if I do plus one, it only updates the store display, right? Because in this particular case, we have directly talked to the store and store had a subscription on a display and so the display re-rendered and then um, you got what you want out of it. Okay, now let's talk about Quick. Quick is the new framework I'm working on. And the, the first thing I want to show you here is that notice it's the only framework where the initial count is essentially zero. Or I know, I, and in my case, I actually put the word SSR, meaning that this value is the value that existed at the time of server-side rendering. And on a client, there is no hydration. And because there is no hydration, the code did not execute. So in this particular case, um, none of the, the code is executing, and so the count is essentially zero, or as I like to make it really clear, you know, uh, SSR, right? So in all other frameworks, um, at the beginning, at hydration, all the code has to execute to kind of set up the, the world. Uh, Quick knows how to do the strict core resumability, and because of that, it doesn't have to do that. So it starts with zero, essentially, over here. But Quick can do another trick, which is that if you do plus one, um, the value updates, but notice the count still stays zero. Well, what is happening here? Like, is it the fact that, um, y you know, like nothing is re-rendering? And the answer is, well, so far, everything I've showed you, then the value changed, the thing to do was to rerun the component. But Quick's reactivity is not necessarily tied to the component, but it's tied to a specific DOM element. Not always, sometimes we have to re-render the, the component, but in this particular example, uh, Quick's reactivity is tied to a specific DOM element. So if the value changes, Quick knows to go and update a specific DOM element, and in this particular case, uh, none of these other components had to be executed. Not only are they not executed, they're not even downloaded into the browser. Right? So in this way, uh, Quick's reactivity is, ex is pretty fine-grained. Now, um, there are cases when Quick has to re-execute re the, the component, and I'm going to show you Solid, which uh, is, works slightly different. But the, the big thing I want to point out over here is that in the Quick's case, um, you don't have to even download the components most of the time, right? So the fact that you have intermediate values like a wrapper, et cetera, are kind of moot. Okay, and so let's finally go solid. Okay, and, and so what's unique about solid is, well, first of all, solid has to go and you know, do hydration. So at, at the beginning, all the components execute. So that's why everybody gets a one. And then, of course, when you hit plus one, uh, solid is the same exact thing, which is the solid is tied directly to the DOM rather than to a specific component, right? So a change in value is causing a update to the DOM rather than update to a component. So let's actually go back over here to this slide and kind of re-review this. So in all cases, the, the, the state was declared with the counter, right? Most frameworks, or rather the course frameworks, had to re-execute everything. And as you get into the finer reactivity kind of frameworks, the frameworks become more intelligent about like, mm, maybe I don't have to re-execute incrementer. Or maybe I can skip the wrapper, because the wrapper is just us um, prop, uh, prop drilling, right? Uh, maybe I can skill, skip counter, because even though counter has a state, um, I don't actually display the value over there in, in there either. Uh, maybe I can just re-render the display, or maybe you can go all the way to the extreme with like quick and solid and say like, actually, I don't need any of this stuff. It's just directly tied to the DOM element. So let me kind of, let's go over it through kind of pieces. So um, the strategy that is being used in these frameworks is um, React and Angular use values, right? And because of that, there is no way to be notified of changes, and so they do have to do some kind of change detection. Um, Vue uses signals. Uh, so, uh, Svelte uses both Sometimes it uses values in the case of a Svelte file, and sometimes it uses observables, which they call stores, in the case when you want to do reactivity across um, 
salt files. And I kind of pointed out like, hey, um, they have different behaviors. And it's actually different behaviors that's observable from the point of view of the, of the developer. Quick has signals and uh, React also has signals as, as well. And so the initial render, um, you know, all of them have to render everything at least once, right? That's the hydration phase. During hydration phase is how the framework kind of learns about the application so the framework knows what to do when you go and interact with the application. And I think this is the unique part here for Quick is that uh, Quick doesn't have to do that. There's no initial render in Quick. We can skip this particular thing. And this is why I think Quick is worth kind of looking into. And so as a result, everybody is basically applying this hydration strategy. And hydration strategy, again, means re-execute everything at the beginning. And Quick is applying this resumability strategy, which is a very different way of thinking about the problem. Um, and I'm going to talk about it more in depth, actually, tomorrow. OK, and so how do updates happen? So um, in, in, uh, in React, you are following the tree, right? The component tree, when a particular state is changed, in, in, in React, wherever the state is declared, in our case, the counter, you follow the tree and you go all the way down. And same thing happens in view. You follow the tree. View is just a little better at pruning the tree out of the box than, than uh, React. Um, Svelte also follows the tree. You, you know, we've seen that when we changed it, the counter state changed and everything showed up. Um, but there was also a second mode of operation in, um, in Vue, which, you know, using the inject, and we were able to bypass the tree, right? And we just directly went to a specific component that we wanted. Same thing could be done through Svelte with stores. Um, that is exactly how Quick works as well. So you, Quick, when you change the value, you are not tied to the component tree. You just go directly to the specific location that needs to be updated, and you do the updating. And it is exactly how... Uh, how uh, signals work as well, uh, sorry, how Svelte works as well is that the tree is not part of the, the computation graph when you have to do change detection, or rather when something changes. But the other thing to kind of look at is what is the unit of work, right? And the smallest unit of work in a case of, of uh, uh, React is a component. That's the least amount of code that can execute. At the minimum, React will re-execute a component. Uh, probably more than one component, which will follow the tree of components in, that you see, but a minimum, a component is what's executed. A component is what's executed inside of the view. A component is what's executed inside of the Svelte. Um, but usually, Quick um, goes directly into, uh, into the specific DOM location, right? So it can bypass the component. So in many cases, Quick uh, doesn't need the component at all. Some cases, it does. So I'm going to basically say both. Uh, but what's interesting about Solid is that, and, and I'm sure uh, Ryan will tell you how proud of he is of this fact, is that uh, in Solid, once the initial render happens, which causes you to run through all the components, once at the beginning, Solid never, ever goes back to the component. Right? So you are guaranteed in Svelte that each component executes exactly once on hydration and then never, ever again uh, in the duration of your application. So, so the difference as you go to finer grain reactivity is that you are no longer, the unit of work is no longer a component, it's basically direct DOM update. And that's what makes uh, the frameworks, as you go to the right, so much more performant in their updates is because uh, the, the amount of work they have to do is just so much smaller. And it's not just the amount of work, right? It's, you can think of it as the amount of code that has to be downloaded so that they can do their job is so much less because you're, you're directly tying to the DOM rather than a component. OK, hopefully you enjoyed it. I think we're going to have a, first of all, I think Ryan is going to tell you about things. And then I think we'll have a Q&A session. So thank you for listening.